Lab number seven is entitled Entertainment System. What we're effectively going to build in this lab is a docking station. So if you have an MP3 player driving a set of headphones, we're going to take that MP3 player or whatever source of music you have and connect it up to a power amplifier that can drive a speaker. We're also going to build a thing called a mixer, which will allow us to combine various sources of sound, in particular a microphone. Now if we use an op amp to drive a speaker, we're going to find a unique problem with trying to do that. The transistors inside the op amp, or really any IC, or just the transistor itself, could melt at some point if you just dissipate too much power in it. Most op amps have a thing called a current limiter built in to stop you from drawing that much current. This is pretty much like our power supply where we can set a limit on how much current we'll take out of it. In the case of the 741 op amp, this is a plus or minus 25 milliamps. In other words, you can push out 25 milliamps and you can take in 25 milliamps maximum, and everything in between. Let's look back at our non-inverting amplifier. Remember the gain here is 1 plus R2 over R1. So if I hook up an input here, the output's going to be 1 plus R2 over R1 times V sub S. Now in this lab, we're going to use a plus and minus 6 volt power supply, mostly to limit the voltage across the speaker so we don't actually melt the transistors we're going to add. With a plus and minus 6 volt power supply, you can swing a pretty clean sine wave out to about plus or minus 5 volts. Suppose we increase the input such that the output is 5 volts, sine omega t. Now if the load here were 200 ohms or more, where 200 ohms is really 5 volts divided by 25 milliamps. The output would be a pure sine wave with 5 volts, minus 5 volts, and then divided by the value of R sub L. But if you had something less than 200 ohms, what happens is the current limiter kicks in, and once you reach 25 milliamps, it won't give you any more, and basically it chops the waveform off at that point. It really just sets a limiter so you can't draw any more current. And likewise, uh, minus 25 milliamps. So if we had an 8 ohm speaker or a 4 ohm speaker, uh, we wouldn't be able to get a full signal across the speaker. What we're going to do is we're going to add some transistors. And of course we've talked about a bipolar junction transistor, or just BJT for short. And there's two types, an NPN and a PNP. This refers to the material from collector, base, and emitter. So here's a P material, positive, and here's N material, negative, and likewise over here. So here I've got my NPN transistor. And really are, there are two diodes, one between the base and the emitter, and one between the base and the collector. But it's more than just that. There's actually a transfer of current pretty much like priming a pump. When you put a little bit of current in here, you can actually draw a lot more current. Now it's going to get this current from the power supply or batteries that you have, so we're not getting any free sources of current. The equation for this is pretty complex, and we don't even list it in the course, because we're not really going to use that. What we're going to take a look at is, what does a plot of voltage and current look like? If you plot the base current versus the base emitter voltage, you see indeed a diode. But if you plot the collector current versus the collector emitter voltage, you actually get a family of curves depending on the value of the base current. Suppose that I had a base current here, I sub B2. The actual curve I would get would look something like this, the current I sub C versus the voltage VC. We call this region here the active region because you actually can make an amplifier out of this. Uh, this region over here is called the saturation region. Really the voltage here is saturated. When we're operating over here, it's called cutoff, where we just turn the transistor off. We'll look at a later lab where we use the transistor as a switch. Now we had models in the course for these three regions. When we're in this active region, we have a constant current that's a multiple of the base current. So that's a current controlled current source where the current I sub B is controlling the current I sub C. The voltage here is fairly constant, so we just treat that like a battery. We'll call it the turn on voltage VB on. And when you operate over here, the collector emitter voltage is pretty much not changing, and you could treat that as a voltage source. And then in cutoff, there's no collector current and actually no base current you're operating over here. The PNP transistor, the PN junctions are reversed the P from the emitter to the base and from the collector to the base. So here is our P and P transistor. You should go from collector base emitter. And again, there's a current source effectively here that has a very long equation. And so you're interested in what the pictures look like. What's interesting about the P and P transistor is that current's coming out of the base and coming out of the collector. You should draw the emitter on top because current schematic drawings will, will flow from the top of the drawing to the bottom of the drawing. In fact, this arrow is just telling you how the current's going to want to flow. If you reverse all the voltages and currents, you get exactly the same picture as we had for the NPN transistor. And the models are basically the same, but every voltage and current is reversed. Here I was just showing if you had a current IB3, you'd be somewhere on this red line in the active region or in the saturation region. Okay, let's add a PNP and an NPN to our non-inverting amplifier, basically as a current booster. We're going to use that amplification of current to boost our current in the load. And the way this is going to work is that when the output voltage is positive, current is going to flow this way. And that's going to cause this PN junction to get forward bias. But that's going to put a negative voltage across this PN junction here. So when the top transistor is on, the bottom one's off. 
and so all the current flows this way. When the output goes negative, current wants to come back in here. Also, someone's going to go down here. But it can't go this way. It can only go back this way. So when this gets forward biased, plus to minus here, then this will be reverse biased. So the top one will be off. We're going to use uh, two power transistors, just originally made by Texas Instruments, where the, the current gain is around 50. A little bit lower than the numbers we've been using in class because the larger transistor has some trade-offs in its parameters. So I'm going to put the feedback loop around here to force the voltage across here to be zero. All this is going to do is give us actually a voltage gain of 1. So whatever voltage we have here in terms of gain is just going to be multiplied by a number close to 1. What's happening here once you forward bias this junction is that any change in voltage here just shows up across here. So that's where the gain of 1 comes from. Okay, for a positive output, we'll have current flowing this way into the load and then back in through here. And that's going to force this PN junction to get forward biased. And again, with a plus and minus 0.6 volts here, we would have a negative plus to minus voltage here. So the bottom transistor is cut off. So we put that model in for the transistor. Between the base and the emitter of transistor 1, I've got the turn on voltage, about say 6 tenths of a volt, and then the current flowing from collector to the emitter of transistor 1, uh, roughly the beta F, what we call beta DC, which is about 50 for this transistor. So the current that's going to come out of here is going to be 50 IB1 plus IB1, so you've got 51 IB1. Now these are going to be some really big resistors, so most of the current's going to actually go down this path. But what you got coming out of here is 51 times the base current but that could be as big as 25 milliamps. So we could draw 1.28 amps. Now for an 8 ohm load with 5 volts, we're looking at about 625 milliamps. So we got more than enough current to drive a speaker. Now when the input goes negative and the output goes negative, current's going to try to flow back in. Now with negative voltage here, current's going to come back in. Can't go back this way, can't flow back to that diode, but can flow back down this way back to the power supply. And we got the same situation. The current here this is mostly the current that's going to be in the low. We have a little bit trickling back here. But what we've got here is IB2 and 50 IB2. Okay. So that output current is, again, 51 times the base current. And that could be as large as 25 milliamps going back in. So again, we've got the same value of current in the opposite direction. And for an 8 ohm speaker, we could drive 625 milliamps. So we've got more than enough current to drive a speaker. Now, when you hook up your MP3 player or whatever source of music you have, uh, we tend to thump the speakers, so we're going to build our own little volume control so we don't do that. I'm just going to put a pot on here. Use a 10K pot, and what we've got is a voltage divider of R2 over R1 plus R2, but R1 plus R2 is the value of the pot. And we're going to set this down on the bottom when we start to hook things up. We'll say we play with your volume control on your MP3 player or whatever source of sound you have. We're actually going to combine a microphone with our music so that we could actually sing with the music if we wanted to, kind of a simple karaoke machine, and ask you not to do this too long, maybe 30 seconds maximum in lab. Here's an example of a three-input mixer. So we've got three voltage sources here. There could be three microphones, could be right and left channel from uh, your MP3 player. And uh, we're going to add it together, get an output here. So let's analyze the circuit. First step is that the voltage across here with feedback is going to be driven to zero. And of course the current is normally very small. That's our first step. Now with zero volts here, we're going to force the voltage V1 across R1, force V2 across R2, and force V3 across R3. The current that flows is just the voltage, in this case V1, you're going to get zero volts here, so all of V1's across here. Divide that by R1, that's my current coming into this node. Same is true here. With 0 volts here, I'm forcing V2 across here, and so I get a current V2 over R2, and lastly for V3 over R3. Now all that current's got to flow back up in these resistors because there's nothing going in the op amp. So our output voltage then, if we just go around this loop here, is the rise in voltage is V out, the drop is minus RF times this summation of current plus the 0 of the voltage across the op amp. You multiply through by R sub F, what I've got here is a minus, RF over R1 times V1, RF over R2 times V2, and RF over R3 times V3. So what we're going to do in lab is actually going to add the right and left channel together. We're just going to use one speaker in lab, and this will be our microphone. The minus sign here will do a phase inversion, but when you're listening to music, you really don't notice that. That's just a time delay. Well, Lab 7 is going to be, again, making an entertainment system, which is going to take an MP3 player and put it through a power amplifier. You can actually, with a mixer and a microphone, use this also as a public address system. Or you can combine the two together and make a simple karaoke machine. So we make a low-cost entertainment system. Uh, we're only using one speaker, we're going to be adding right and left channels. And so in some sense, it could be a low cost in the sense that you couldn't afford the second speaker. Or something that may fit in your dorm room if space is tight. The concepts that we covered here and in the lab itself are the current limit of an op amp, 
the non-inverting amplifier, the VI characteristics, and really models of NPN and PMP transistors, stereo mineral, mineral conversion, and lastly mixing with an inverting summer. The laboratory techniques we're going to be covering is triggering of the oscilloscope, averaging to reduce noise. We're also going to use the thing called high frequency noise rejection so we can improve our triggering and stability of our waveform on the screen, unless we're going to measure some voltage gain. And this is lab seven in entertainment system.